Good morning or afternoon or evening or whatever. Anyway, um, hi. Today we are talking about the third section of chapter seven. Um, Wednesday you will be doing this same video type thing for the last section. Um, the review for the test will be Monday and the test over chapter seven will be Tuesday. So please make sure that you know um, your vocab, especially, uh, and that you understand all this earthquake stuff. Today we're talking about measuring and predicting earthquakes. It's going to be a real short video, hopefully. So here we go. By the time you get done, you should be able to describe how to find an earthquake epicenter. Describe the different earthquake magnitude scales and what the numbers for momentum ma moment magnitude mean. Describe how earthquakes are predicted and why the field of earthquake prediction has had little success. <clears throat> so we've already talked about seismographs and seismology and all that neat, wonderful stuff. All those size words. Um, but this is kind of a review of seismologists needed a way to record seismic waves um, so that they could analyze those waves to give them more information about earthquakes. Uh, the device used to produce a graph-like presentation representation is called a seismograph. Um, this is an old seismograph and it is the basis of what even the new seismographs are. Uh, you have a solid frame that is basically bolted to or somehow attached to a solid surface. Um, from that frame, you have a spring that hangs down and <clears throat> a weight on the bottom of that spring. Um, a lot of them have a control, a confiner, but not all of them. That just keeps the, um, the weight from going like crazy all over everywhere. It keeps it in that one little space. Um, attached to the weight is usually a pen and very close touching just the tip of the pen is a rotating drum. And as the earth shakes, this goes back and forth. The weight is enough that the weight doesn't really move very much. Um, but the machine itself as the ground moves, the, the machine itself moves back and forth. And so the weight actually marks on that rotating drum. Um, <clears throat> the product that is produced is a graph like representation. And so it's called a seismograph earth shake graph. Um, it looks like this on a seismograph. And the part of the seismograph that actually detects ground motion is the seismometer. Um, a lot of people use these words together. Um, and um, because they are so close and they're seismo seismograph and seismometer, seismometer is part of a seismograph. So those words are used interchangeably. This is what a recording or a seismogram looks like. Um, it shows you when the P waves arrive and then notice the P waves start to slow down and then the S waves come. Seismologists can use that to figure out how strong an earthquake was. They use it for how long an earthquake lasted and how far away it was. There is a calculation that they can do that is the difference between the P wave and the S wave. To find the epicenter of an earthquake, remember the epicenter is the point on the surface directly above the focus. It is the point where we feel it first on the surface. Uh, to find that epicenter, seismologists need at least three seismographs need the readings from at least three seismographs. Then they just follow these steps. First, they determine the distance to the epicenter from each seismograph. And to do that, they look at the time between the P and S waves. 
because the farther away something is from the epicenter, the greater the uh, distance between the P and S waves or the greater the time between the P and S waves. They can use that difference and then do a calculation and come up with how far away it was from that particular seismograph. So they find that and then they draw circles and the radius of that circle is equal to the distance from the epicenter for each seismograph. So this one is 1800 kilometers from the seismograph, which is right here. And then they figured out the calculation and they know that this is 1800 kilometers and they drew a circle. That means that that earthquake happened somewhere on that circle. Then they did a second one. This is where the seismograph was. They did their calculations and it was 1300 kilometers away. So they drew a circle that is 1300 kilometers from that. That is where these two points is where this circle intersects with this circle. That means that the earthquake could have happened here or it could have happened here. So that's why they need a third one. They used this seismograph. They did their calculations and it was 800 kilometers away. So they drew a circle that was an 800 kilometer radius. And the place where all three of these circles meet is where the epicenter is. It's not hard to do. And if we were in class, we would actually do an activity with that. There are three scales that they use to measure earthquakes. The first one is the Mercalli intensity scale. It has a 12 point scale. And if you look at this, um, it's basically a description of what was felt or what damage was done during the earthquake. So if, um, if somebody, if they were just sitting down watching TV or something, they were at rest and they noticed it, but nobody else did, then it would have been a two on the Mercalli scale. But if, um, several buildings were destroyed, then it would have been a 10. Um, things in between that, I like this one, it's rather strong if dishes are broken and bells ring, if you have a pendulum clock and it gets stopped. If you wake up from a sleep, um, it's gonna at least be a five. Um, now, I think that that's a little bit um, misleading because I sleep through a lot more than my husband sleeps through. So that could be a little iffy. Um, if your chimney falls and there's a whole lot of substantial damage done to substantial buildings, if you've got really heavy furniture and it overturns, you're looking at an eight. Um, so you can read the descriptions of those, but that's how they decide on a Mercalli scale, um, how they decide what number the earthquake was, how bad the earthquake was. The second one is called a Richter scale. This is the one that most people use, um, or used to use, I should say, uh, it goes from one to 10. I know this one only shows eight. Um, a one, you're not even going to feel it. You're not even going to know it was there. It can be measured by instruments, but that's about it. Um, a seismometer uses the Richter scale. It measures the magnitude of the largest jolt produced by the earthquake. So the, the largest spike on the seismogram. Um, Amplitude is going to increase 10 times from one to the next. So there's going to be, it's going to have uh, that, that wave, remember that we talked about, it's going to be 10 times greater for each number. Um, I put this on here so that you could see kind of how, it, how the Richter scale 
uh, matches up to the Mercalli scale. Um, a two might be felt there. You might feel it like a two and a half might feel like a passing truck. Um, it's noted, it's noticed by people inside, especially on upper floors, but you may not recognize it as an earthquake. Um, but when you get here to even a three, you can feel it indoors, outdoors, maybe by a few. Um, at night, you might start waking up. Your dishes are going to rattle. Um, it'll feel more like a heavy truck ran into the building. Um, your, your cars are going to rock a little bit. Uh, and so it just gets worse and worse as you go down. Um, and eight is disastrous or catastrophic. Nines are everything in the world. Everything is going to be, not everything in the world, everything in the area is going to be destroyed. Um, I'm not sure we've ever had a 10. Maybe we have, but I don't know for sure. Um, the moment magnitude scale uses the area of the fault or how much of the fault ruptured and the distance the ground moved along the fault and actually then determines the total energy release. This is what most people use now. Um, this is a great example of how much energy released and then they did an equivalent to uh, kilograms of explosives. Um, and it also gives us how many we have, number of earthquakes per year worldwide, and then the um, an example of what happened that would equal that, and then the kilograms of explosives. So most of them are 56 kilograms of explosive or lighter, it's less than an, a moderate lightning bolt. Um, and then you move up to Oklahoma City bombing, 1,800 kilograms of explosives. Uh, we have about 100,000 of those. Uh, all the way up to up here at a, at a magnitude of 10. Um, Notice that uh, this one goes down, uh, so it's a little bit different. Both the Richter and the moment magnitude scale, the amplitude increases by 10 from one number to the next. But the thing about this is both of them, the amount of energy released increases by 30. Um, that's quite a difference from just an increase of 10. Most scientists now are using the moment magnitude scale. It's much more accurate in showing the energy released and, and showing the amount of damage done because the Richter scale only measures that first, that giant, the biggest jolt. The ma moment magnitude is the total energy. So it's much more accurate. So how many earthquakes do we have? We have approximately 900,000 to a million earthquakes recorded every year. Only about 150 of those, 150,000 of those are strong enough to feel. So we have quite a few that earthquakes, nobody even knows they happen except for a seismogram or a seismograph. Um, of those 150,000, only 18 are between a seven and a nine or a seven and a 7.9. Um, one of those is between an eight and an 8.9. And there have only been five recorded magnitude nine earthquakes since 1900. So that's 120 years. Um, we've only had five magnitude nines. And all of those were around the Pacific Basin. Remember, we said that most bad earthquakes happen around the Pacific Basin. Most volcanoes happen around the Pacific Basin. There's a lot of activity because there's a lot of plate boundaries there. So now we got to come to prediction. 
basically it's non-existent. Why? Because to accurately predict an earthquake, you have to know where it's going to happen. You have to know when it's going to happen. And you have to know what magnitude this earthquake is probably going to be. Well, at this point, we can't accurately predict any of those things. Now, we do know that usually they are going to occur at plate boundaries um, and where they've happened before, but not always. We have, sometimes we have, like in Indiana, we have these intraplate earthquakes that aren't at plate boundaries. Have they happened here before? Yes, but it's not at a plate boundary. So they're not ever really sure about when that's going to happen or where that's going to happen. Remember too that plate boundaries are really long. So it's not like, you know, there's one little plate boundary right here where we are. And so this is where the earthquake's going to be. It could be anywhere along that plate boundary. We also know that stress builds up at the same rate over time. So earthquakes should happen at regular times. Every 150,000 years, every 2,000 years, every 500 years, it should happen on a regular basis as that stress builds up but they don't um, because we can't predict when that rock is going to really break, when we're going to have that shift. Um, we also th should be about the same magnitude. If there's the same amount of stress building up over time, then there should also be about the same magnitude. Well, because it's not building up at exactly the same time, they don't eru or erupt. Um, they don't shift at regular times, then the magnitudes are different. Um, so there is no, at this point, there is no accurate way to predict when an earthquake is going to happen, where it's going to happen, or what the magnitude is. So, yes, we're working on that. Well, scientists are, Mrs. Skipper is not, um, but they still have not achieved that ability yet. Tomorrow, you're going to be doing the study guide over this section. Wednesday, we will talk about earthquake safety, and then Thursday, you will do the study guide over that. Friday will be a review to era makeup day. Monday is going to be the a week from today is going to be the review for the test. Please use that review. Um, remember, because it is a it is the test. So I'm giving you the test to study for the test. Um, and then the test will be on Tuesday. So make sure you get your stuff done. Have a wonderful rest of the day. See you. Bye.